welcome to ADB Insight, a webcast from the Asian Development Bank focusing on development issues across the Asia-Pacific region. I'm Nisha Pillay. Tourism is one of the foundations of the Asia-Pacific economy. Some 700 million people holiday here in a normal year. But this is not a normal year. Once bustling tourist hotspots resemble ghost towns as the impact of COVID-19 casts a heavy pall over the entire industry. Tourism here stands to lose 70 million jobs, plus $1.1 trillion in GDP, more than any other region in the world. And travel hubs are feeling the impact just as much as the destinations themselves, as the entire travel industry tries to figure out how to reopen safely during a global pandemic. What precautions will operators and travellers have to take? And how will the industry need to adapt in order to survive? Later, we'll have a panel discussion with experts from the development, the airline and the hotel sectors. But first, to our interview. Tiffany Mizrahi is Vice President for Policy at the World Travel and Tourism Council. Tiffany Mizrahi, thank you for joining us on ADB Insight. Well, we know that the COVID pandemic has had the most devastating impact on the travel and tourism sector. Could you put this in context for us, give us the big picture, both globally and also specifically for the Asia Pacific region? Sure, and uh, maybe to start, give, give you a perspective of where this sector was about a year ago. We accounted for 330 million jobs on the planet. 10.3% uh, of global GDP, and our sector was growing faster than the global economy for the ninth consecutive year. Um, but to give you a sense of the magnitude of the crisis, here are our latest estimates. We, we've seen that so far, 142 million jobs of the 330 millions have been lost to date as a result of COVID-19. That amounts to $3.8 trillion losses. And we estimate that if restrictions don't get eased and things don't get better, by the end of the year, would that figure could reach 174 million jobs. Can you give us a sense of the social impact of this? The scale of the job losses is beyond belief. What does it mean in terms of, of lives, the, the, the gains that have been made, getting people out of poverty? Can you paint us a picture? Travel and tourism isn't only a sector that has high contribution to GDPs and job. It em uh, and employs obviously many, many people, but it has tremendous social impact. It meaningfully changes the lives of people and all the communities that it touches. It reduces poverty, inequality, uh, it enriches community, both economically and socially. It fosters innovation. It's a sector where people can start at the bottom uh, and, and make it all the way to the top. So you could start a career as a receptionist and become the general manager. It's no surprise then that across the industry, there's a hunger to get going again and reopen. But that depends critically on consumers feeling safe to travel, and governments feeling that it's safe to reopen borders. And that's very difficult to achieve, isn't it? Because countries are, are battling with this pandemic. Many in the region feel we've now managed to get a handle on things. We're make, making some progress. Why would we risk by opening up our borders? It's just not worth it. How do you persuade them? I you know, I think it's the value that we've talked about. I think the importance of um, the impact of travel and tourism on their country, on their economy, on the people. Um, you know, it fuels so many economies around the world. And, uh, and you know, we want to make sure that countries are not only healthy from a health perspective, but also from an economic one. And it's finding that right balance and ensuring the health and safety of people economically and, and socially. What advice can you give, do you think? To, to governments who are beginning to consider whether to open up and to development organizations like the ADB, what kind of role can they play to facilitate this, this process? So actually, under the leadership of Saudi Arabia and its presidency of the G20, the global uh, travel and tourism private sector was asked to put a plan together uh, through WTTC to support the recovery of the sector and hopefully bring back 100 million jobs. So one point that we highlighted was 
modifying quarantine measures for to be for positive tests only. So replace blanket quarantines with a more targeted and effective approach and, and thereby significantly reducing the negative impact on jobs and on the economy. The second is to continue to support uh, the most affected by COVID-19 within the travel and tourism sector. So whether it's the SMEs uh, or the larger corporations in terms of fiscal stimulus, uh, incentives and the protection of workers. And finally, um, I think it's going to be incredibly important to continue investing in crisis preparedness and resilience to better equip the sector to respond to future risks or shocks. Tiffany Mizrahi, you're such a powerful advocate for the industry. Thank you for joining us on ADB Insight. Thank you for having me. I want to bring in our panel now, and we're joined by Dr. Mario Hardy, CEO of the Pacific Asia Travel Association, Shubhash Menon, Director General of the Association of Asia Pacific Airlines, Sophia Chua, Director of Quality Assurance and Compliance at Banyan Tree Hotels and Resorts, and Stephen Shapani, the ADB's Tourism Specialist for Southeast Asia. Welcome to you all. Stephen, I'd like to start with you. Although travel and tourism is in pretty bad shape right now, what do you think are the prospects for a gradual recovery, given that in our area, the Asia Pacific region, so many countries have dealt with the pandemic really robustly and community transmission is extremely low? Yeah, well, thank you, Nisha. And I think that there's actually very strong prospects for a good recovery uh, in the countries that have been able to control COVID and their efforts are continuing to prevent and control COVID well. Now, that said, we expect an ex a recovery in phases. Uh, the first phase being domestic tourism, later when borders are safe to open uh, and countries can agree with one another on protocols to do that, we would expect a resumption in international tourism. But right now, countries, for example, the People's Republic of China, Vietnam, Thailand, that have, have large domestic markets, um, large populations, they've seen a quick rebound in domestic tourism. Sophia Chua, if I can bring you in now, are you seeing that on the ground at Banyan Tree? Are your properties in China, Vietnam, Thailand seeing a rebound compared with others in, in your portfolio? Hi, Nisha. Thanks so much. Um, yes, actually, domestic market travel is actually uh, picking up, especially in China. So pre-COVID, there was already a domestic demand, but it has surged even more post-COVID or in the current times because um, of the need to travel around and also because of other lockdowns in other countries. Mario Hardy, some areas in the region are so dependent on travel and tourism. Over 50% of their economy comes from our sector. Um, they can't simply afford to, to sit it out, can they? They're not going to be able to get domestic tourists to fill that gap, or will they? Uh, no, uh, we, we know from research that we've conducted earlier in the year that uh, many of the SMEs, the small businesses and resorts around the region here are closed. Uh, many of the businesses have closed uh, permanently, uh, which is obviously a, a, a real challenge. Shubhash Menon, arguably the airline sector has been hit hardest of all. Um, how do you see the current outlook? Well, it doesn't have to be as dire as it uh, seems at the moment. Uh, this is because I think uh, uh, governments in the Asia-Pacific region are risk averse. You know? uh, we have seen uh, uh, a good recovery in the domestic market. In fact, domestic travel is up to almost 70% of what it was in 2019, with capacity around 80% of what it was uh, a year ago. Um, because the governments have taken a lighter touch to domestic travel and opened up uh, domestic travel, it has rebounded. So if a similar... Uh, sort of approach is taken to international travel, uh, I think uh, we will see a, a quicker revival and recovery. But you can understand why so many governments in the region are risk averse, as you put it, or super cautious. They look at what happened in Europe, where travel bubbles were created over the summer, and now there's a second wave of COVID going on. So what would you say to persuade them that it'll be different where you are in the Asia-Pacific region? Well, in the Asia-Pacific region, I think uh, there are two factors. One, uh, the containment of the virus is a pace. Uh, and secondly, uh, the uh, response to the virus have been uh, uh, very, uh, very good. 
you know, uh, not only in terms of testing, but also contact tracing and making sure that public health uh, facilities can cope. As long as public health facilities can cope, and as long as contact tracing and testing uh, are good, uh, then uh, the risk uh, is pretty much uh, mitigated as far as the risk of uh, importation of cases is concerned. Here in Asia, most countries have a really good handle on number of cases in their respective countries. Everyone around Asia is very accustomed to wearing masks. So the protocols are really well observed by the population here. I think what is really important is the is a safe reopening, reopening gradually and not open blanket uh, to all destinations, but to green corridors with respective destinations and opening gradually and ensuring that the safety, the safety protocols are put in place. Uh, good testing are put in place, good contact tracing, uh, the common pass or the digital health passport put in place to track who's been tested, when they have been tested, and uh, when the vaccine is available. Uh, who's been vaccinated and et cetera. Digital passports that you just mentioned, Mario, now that requires transparency of data across borders, a lot of personal information, health information, tracking information. Might there be resistance from travelers about sharing their data in this way? Sophia Chua, could I ask you that question? Yes, I think a digital passport, although it's good, but I think there is the concern on data privacy, especially if it's going to be tracking your every move. So usually, for example, in Singapore, we all have to install an app by December, or if not currently, you are actually checking in and checking out at various locations as you go. So the government actually knows where you're moving. So this question then begets the traveler, would they want to be tracked by the host country's um, government in that sense? So what about quarantines? Tiffany Mizrahi from the World Travel and Tourism Council said that quarantines don't work, they should be dispensed with. If someone has a negative test, that should be trusted by the country they're going to. What do you think? Well, it is the greatest impediment to travel, I think, you know, quarantine. You know, it's uh, like um, basically swatting a housefly with a sledgehammer. You know? um, and the reason why uh, people are quarantined is so that the uh, health authorities can do the testing. So why not just uh, shoot straight to testing, you know, because that will be the, the measure of choice, you know, also of travelers who are prepared to put up with uh, testing in order to be able to travel. But I think the biggest, biggest issue is the trust among governments, because we need governments to, to come together, see eye to eye, and draw up uh, uh, protocols for testing and uh, implementation of measures uh, so that everything is harmonized and everything is standardized rather than the patchy framework that we have to confront today. Mario Hardy, quarantines, are we ready to dispense with them? Uh, we certainly hope so. We, we have the same philosophy as WTTC. Actually, pretty much all international organizations are in the same opinion that actually quarantine is only effective if people were actually are positive. But if you're negative, testing is really critical. As Subhas mentioned, as long as we do pre-departure testing, possibly testing at arrival if necessary also. Uh, there is no need for quarantine. It's a discouragement for people to travel. It's inconvenient um, and really costly for the travelers also and uh, affects the economy. Stephen Shapani, what is the ADB doing to get governments to be a little less cautious and to talk to each other and coordinate their response so that tourism can get off the ground again? Well, Nisha, one of ADB's priorities is, is promoting regional cooperation. Uh, and we see in a pandemic situation like this, regional cooperation is, is more important than ever. So ADB, with our coronavirus response uh, lending and technical assistance and policy advice that we've been making available for our developing members, we've convened a number of expert groups um, whereby we've worked with high level decision makers in government to give advice on formulating sound policies for a cautious reopening, for a response and other recovery measures that can take place. We've been talking a lot about what governments should do, but what about the industry itself? So Sophia Chua, can you tell us what is Banyan Tree doing and the hotel sector doing to address the immense health and safety challenges of COVID-19? So for Banyan Tree, we've actually launched the Safe Sentry program. So it's actually an integrated health and well-being program. So we look after the health by enhancing the um, cleaning measurements that the hotel is taking. We do provide 
uh, safe places for the guests to stay. So we also have the well-being section where we actually focus on deep sleep or focus on helping them improve their well-being through various um, relaxation modes as well as bringing some activities in the villa. So for example, you have online yoga or meditation sessions as well as um, maintaining a very safe environment so that the guests have the assurance that the place is safe. In addition to that, we do work with a third-party certification office that does the certification for our hotels. So it's in progress to make sure all our hotels are independently certified that they are clean and safe for travellers to come. Okay, so independent certification is clearly key. Um, Shubhash Menon, what is the airline industry doing to address the same point that travellers are really safe when they're in the skies? Well, not just the airline industry, but the whole aviation industry um, has adopted and applied uh, what we call the uh, International Civil Aviation Organization's CART takeoff guidance, you know, which were issued in the, at the beginning of June. This addresses every single aspect of the traveler's journey, you know, from before he comes to the airport and gets on a flight and then uh, until he arrives at the destination. So these measures are all uh, being implemented, including social distancing, mask wearing, you know, which is compulsory. And the guidance uh, recommends that uh, only travelers and airline and airport workers are allowed at the airport uh, and also contactless and uh, digital services that are provided at the airport in the uh, aircraft. And uh, on the aircraft, uh, we have what we, we call the HEPA filters, which is the high efficiency particulate air filters which are basically hospital grade filters, you know, and the air is recirculated every two, three minutes. In the hospitals, is usually about every 10 to 20 minutes. But you know, Shubhash, despite what you're saying, most people are really anxious about getting on board a plane, being in, up in the air for two, three, four, five hours or more. Um, how safe is it to travel? What would you say to them? It is very safe, you know. I mean, uh, even though there are very little passengers right now, uh, there have not been uh, any uh, uh, proven incidents of uh, in-flight transmission. What uh, countries are guarding against is imported cases where people who, have, who are catching the infection abroad and uh, bringing it home, they're not really catching it on the aeroplane. You know? uh, air travel is one of the safest uh, uh, possible modes of transport you know, for, for anyone to, to consider. How safe are airports? I, I believe they're pretty much safe. I mean, I've traveled uh, uh, on uh, domestic flight uh, recently, and uh, of course we have to get there a little bit earlier. There's new protocols in place at the airport, temperature checks, sanitizations, um, and other checks are actually conducted, at least for domestic travel. International travel, you'll have the testing also, which will take a little bit more time. Uh, but I didn't feel on necessarily unsafe in the airport in any other ways, uh, wearing our mask, obviously, sanitizing, but it will affect travelers moving forward in, in a sense that their journey will be longer. I also think that it's important to communicate clearly what those protocols are, uh, what government, what the private sector is doing uh, to make sure that the, you know, the tourism and travel industry is safe to receive visitors. Uh, ADB, we're the convener and, and, and we help advise uh, a number of intergovernmental sub-regional tourism working groups across Asia and the Pacific and this is something that we've heard from, from governments is that, OK, we really want to be able to communicate clearly. Uh, can you give us some good examples, uh, good, good policies, good practices on what we can do to get the message out? Um, once again, just so consumers are informed uh, that, yes, efforts are really being made to make to make ensure that you're safe in your travels. Is that message getting through, do you think, Stephen? I think it is. And you can you look at the print media, look at what's online. It's it's easier and easier to find this information now. Uh, in the beginning, there was mixed messages. Um, sometimes messages were unclear. Um, so this further undermined travelers' confidence. So we've been talking a lot about the uh, getting the nuts and bolts in place. But do people actually want to travel? Is there an appetite to travel? Yes, earlier in the crisis, we conducted a sentiment analysis across China. And uh, later in the crisis, not too long ago, about a month, two months ago, we conducted a similar sentiment analysis across uh, Europe and the rest of Asia. And there's an immense desire for people to travel overseas. 
And most people have said as soon as the borders are reopened, they will jump in a plane, they will travel. Let's assume you manage to persuade countries to begin to reopen their borders. Apparently, people want to travel, the demand is there. Are we ready to go? Is the infrastructure ready and in place? Can we just click our fingers and get going? Asia and the Pacific has some of the best gateway infrastructure in the world. You know, modern airports, other types of you know port facilities, port of entry facilities, and with the expanded availability of testing, I think the answer is yes. Shubhash? Several uh, airports in the Asia-Pacific region are also building uh, testing centers, but notwithstanding there are enough uh, tests being conducted uh, in most, uh, most countries. Just imagine this, you know, um, domestic travel is already 70% of what it was in 2019, right? And how was that possible? It's because people want to travel and they are happy to travel and uh, airports and airlines are able to uh, accommodate uh, travel with all the um, new uh, measures and uh, precautions uh, that need to be taken. Otherwise, we will not be able to uh, see travel uh, bounce back to, to the levels uh, that they have. You know, so everyone is ready to travel. Airlines are ready, airports are ready to receive uh, travelers. We just hope that the governments will be able to apply the same uh, risk mitigating measures that they applied for domestic travel to international travel. In terms of readiness, we've seen some countries announce that they are in fact ready to do that. And I, I, I recently saw that Singapore and Hong Kong, Hong Kong China have set up a travel bubble uh, whereby they'll allow testing upon departure and arrival without mandatory quarantine. Um, back to the issue of quarantine, I think that yes, leisure travelers uh, would be very averse to quarantine, especially if it was more than a few hours for a test uh, upon landing. Um, business travelers or international experts that move around uh, may be willing to quarantine for a longer period, but it would be very difficult to get a resumption in international leisure travel uh, while we have longer quarantines in place. Tell us more about these travel corridors that some countries are beginning to talk about in bilateral negotiations. Give us a quick overview. Sure, sure. Well, I mentioned uh, Singapore and, and Hong Kong, China. Um, I, I also understand that Thailand uh, is talking to the People's Republic of China, which is its largest sending market. And I, I would guess that other countries are also speaking with the People's Republic of China because it is the world's largest uh, outward sending, you know, world's largest source market for international tourism, um, forms the top market in, in, in many countries in Southeast Asia or across Asia and the Pacific. Um, in the Pacific region, uh, Fiji, New Zealand, uh, Australia, were, earlier were in talks about setting up uh, what they call a Bula bubble. Um, this is welcome in, 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 in Fiji language. Um, and, and I believe those talks are ongoing. Well, someone who's um, involved in trying to iron out this kind of travel bubble or travel corridor is Sophia Chua from the Banyan Tree Group. Sophia, I understand Banyan Tree is part of discussions to open up a corridor between Singapore and the Maldives and Singapore and some Indonesian islands. What do you see as the potential stumbling blocks at this stage that need to be ironed out before this can happen? Yes, so some of the key stumbling blocks we see is firstly, there's a lot of mention on various protocols that you have for the airports, for the airlines, for the hotels and all. It's more of an alignment of these protocols across the whole travel to ecosystem is important because you cannot have various protocols and for a traveler, you have to take a test maybe two, three times. Can they be a standardized test or standardized protocols that will be followed throughout the whole journey. So they make it easier for a traveler to go from one place to the other and have both governments acknowledge the same protocols that are being followed by both sides. Secondly is the integrity of the PCR test because currently every government is doing it differently. So do we have a digital passport, a digital health passport or a similar test or app that was mentioned earlier that is recognized across both borders? And thirdly, obviously, is government support and government approval with regards to the quarantines. COVID pandemic has turned all our lives upside down. What is it doing to the industry in terms of driving change, accelerating change towards possibly a more positive and more stable and robust industry? Is that too much of a big ask? So what we've seen is an acceleration of implementation of new technologies, technologies that are already in plans and progress pre-COVID-19 are now actually being accelerated. Uh, touchless uh, check-in at hotels, at flights, 
uh, airports and etc and uh, payment technologies and others that are actually were were there but um, we were in anticipated to get in several years from now or now actually being implemented today uh, that's a really positive uh, side of it the other positive side is that we know from search that people are purposely looking for ecotourism or sustainable destinations to travel to and also for hotel properties and resorts and other products and tourism that are greener uh, at, at this point, which is really interesting. Yeah, Mario, on that, I mean, I, I agree. And we've seen that the ADB were helping uh, the Philippines prepare a tourism project now. And some of the potential investments that the government's identified as important are small infrastructure. We're helping to spread tourists to natural areas uh, where they can, you know, be more in touch with nature, um, local experiences, but also contactless payments, you know, helping local small and medium enterprises being able to use contactless payment technology um, and, and other types of technologies that can make the consumer feel safer along that tourism value chain. Finally, I'd like to ask each of you in turn, do you have one key message for governments, for policymakers about how to get the industry going again? What would you advise? Um, Shubhash Menon. Well, my, my thought is that uh, the industry has come together during this crisis, and I believe the industry is speaking with one voice. Uh, we also need the governments on board. You know? uh, we can totally understand why the governments are prioritizing the uh, containment of the virus, but uh, we want them to come on board and uh, we want them to include us in the planning and development uh, of the infrastructure as well as reimagining uh, air travelers journey so that uh, we can successfully uh, reopen uh, air travel. Sophia Chua, your thoughts, please. Yeah, I think it's important that everyone works together. So governments need to assist because we do have industry alliances that were created out of this pandemic to be able to think out of the box and create test cases or pilot projects to be able to show that tourism can work in this time and place. So I think it's more of they need to get um, to work together with the various um, stakeholders in this travel ecosystem to be able to have a safe environment for all travelers to be able to travel. Stephen Shapani, your key message? Well, I think that tourism is a tremendously resilient industry. Um, it supports millions of jobs. It generates billions and billions of dollars each year in revenue uh, and investment across Asia and the Pacific. It's tremendously important for the economies in the region. Um, it's important to remember that Asia and the Pacific hasn't lost what makes it such an attractive tourist destination, both for domestic and for international tourists. The tourism industry needs help to weather the storm. Um, and I hope that we can use this once in a lifetime event to really reimagine, rethink uh, the way the tourism industry operates so we can build back greener, we can build back more inclusive, and we can build back more sustainable tourism. Mario Hardy. We understand the difficulties and the challenges that governments are facing at the moment of deciding between the health and safety of their citizens and residents with the reopening of their borders. But we as an industry need to have plans in place. We want to understand from the various governments a timeline, the protocols that will be put in place, how and when the reopening will start so that businesses can plan for it, that they can actually budget for 2021, they can train their staff, bring their staff back into their business and start promoting and selling their products for 21 and 22 onward. So preparedness and planning is really key. And I hope that governments are listening who are gonna be putting plans forward to inform the industry about um, what's coming up for us. Thank you. Mario Hardy, Stephen Shapani, Sophia Chua and Shubhash Menon. Thank you to you all for joining us on ADB Insight and for a rich and insightful discussion. Wherever you're watching us from, thank you for joining us too. I'm Nisha Pillay. Until the next time, goodbye. Thank you.